You are listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net. Well, hey, Foundry Church, welcome. As we get going today into the Word of God, um, these things have been the bane of my existence since they came out. A sea salt grinder. Ooh, did you see that? Badoop. Um, uh, because when I was young, my favorite prank at restaurants was to take a napkin and unscrew the salt shaker and put it inside the lid, and somebody would be like, what is going on? And you're like, especially older gentlemen who like salty food would get so mad. But I think my favorite prank we ever did with a salt shaker was we replaced the salt with granulated sugar, which is awesome because... Um, <clears throat> It's just, so you're sitting there and you've got to watch the table that got the sugar, right? And the person salts their food and you're like, oh yes, it's happening. And um, they take a bite and they're expecting this this kind of bitter kick, this this salty, you know, kind of jolt to their food. And all of a sudden they're like, what is in there? And then it takes, a, a you generally, there's a few minutes of investigative work and they're like, somebody put sugar in this. Right? Like, it's just one of the great pranks. And kids, if you've never done it, I invite you. Enrich your life. Do it. Give it a whirl. But you you, ha- you can't use one of these, right? You can't use one of the twist top shakers because, I don't know, they don't make, you know, sugar grinders. So um, when, you, when you do it, like, and, I, and parents, I'm sorry, but it's worth it. You, you're a kid once, right? You can get away with it. There's grace for them to pull these pranks. But I loved those when I was little to watch um, – like a relative or somebody kind of freak out because they got sugar instead of salt. And uh, when we think about salt, maybe some of you know Salty, the hymnal. That's pus salty. That's out of the psalm. So that's not actually salt. But Salty, the hymnal, was the, it was a kid's thing for, I think, for Christian kids. Maybe we were nerds. I don't know, but we'll deal with it. Um, So when we talk about salt, one of the things that I find fascinating about salt is it's incredibly abundant, uh, especially on the roads in Michigan in winter. But but it's incredibly abundant, and without salt, everything loses flavor. If you ask any good chef who lays out a nice, thick Delmonico steak and say, what should I put on it? They will say two things, salt and pepper. Don't ruin it with other stuff. Put salt on it Get, and be generous with the salt on a steak, right? When we season things, everything needs salt. I don't know if you know this, but um, my wife, Erica, when she was kind of like, she baked with the kids a ton or she bakes with them a ton. And uh, one of the things they could never understand was the pinch, pinch of salt that went in to chocolate chip cookies. But if you don't put the salt in, there's actually no flavor. They're just sweet and there's no kind of, no play off the taste buds to kind of show how sweet and savory and good they actually are. So the salt pulls flavor out of it. It it makes things layered and complex that were once very basic. So we understand uh, that without salt, it doesn't matter what else you put into chocolate chip cookies. If you don't put a pinch of salt, everything has a bit of a meh to it. It just loses the distinctiveness of what it's supposed to be. So a pinch of salt matters from cookies to a good Delmonico steak. When we know that um, that this is uh, something Jesus talked about, Jesus talks to us about being salty. So we're going to read today Luke chapter 14, 25 Uh, through, I think, 38 here. So here it goes. A large crowd was following Jesus. He turned around and he said to them, if you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else. Your father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters. Yes, you must even hate your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you can't be my disciple. But don't begin. Well, and I want to say something real quick back in this thing. That's a hard thing to hear. Like you think like, oh, man, 
What is Jesus doing? Why would, he, why would he challenge us like this? But we need to understand that this comfortable Christianity we seek, where all our needs are met and nothing is asked of us, where nothing of us is required, we just get to receive eternal life and we get to kind of like start floating on a cloud now, that is not Christianity. Jesus calls us to lose our own life in order that his life may be lived through us. Okay, verse 28. But don't begin until you have counted the cost. So don't Don't become my disciple until you've counted the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there's enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you may complete only the foundation and run out of money, and then everyone would laugh at you. They would say, there's the person who started that building and couldn't afford to finish it. Or... What king would go to war against another king without first sitting down with the counselors and discussing whether his army of 10,000 could defeat the 20,000 soldiers marching against him? And if he cannot defeat them, he will send a delegation to discuss terms of peace while the enemy is still far away. See, you cannot become my disciple without first giving up everything you own. Salt is good for seasoning, but if it loses its flavor, how do you make it salty again? Flavorless salt is good neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown away. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. So let's take a minute and wrestle with the idea of what Jesus said first and then come back to this idea of saltiness. So what does it mean to carry a cross. It is a very foreign concept for us in the Western world and in the modern era to think of carrying a cross. It just doesn't make a ton of sense to us. But the reality is, in Jesus' day, it was the loudest of um, cultural images. If the Romans wanted to make an example of certain people, certain insurrectionists, they would crucify them It was a form of execution in the Roman world. It didn't just happen to Jesus. It happened to thousands of people across the Roman Empire. And crucifixion was a loud, painful, long way of dying. So to take up a cross, for Jesus to say, if you want to be my disciple, you must first take up your cross. To them, that would be like someone saying, if you want to be my friend, you need to grab your electric chair and come with me. Get sparky and let's go for a walk. That just seems crazy to us. We don't think in those terms. But Jesus picked the most brutal form of death. And he said, if you want to be my disciple, not only do you have to die to yourself, but it has to literally, life has to be carved out of you so that his life can fill us. It's a brutal image. But in devotions this week, you read about Jesus teaching on humility. If you were in the devotional this week, you read about Jesus teaching on humility. And I think humility and carrying a cross have a lot to do with one another. Because our pride and our ego want to exalt ourselves. The very first sin of all humanity is the exaltation of people against God, wanting to be like God. Our pride is the root of our evil. And so humility is the counter of it. Humility is the thing that only God can give us. And only we, deep inside, we have to choose it and fight for it. So in our devotions, Jesus tells us, don't take the best seat when you come into a banquet. Instead, be humble. Be humble. Don't put yourself in a position to be shamed. And when we know that um, choosing humility in some form is the taking up of a cross, It's the taking up of our cross. Are you willing to decrease so that Christ in you may increase? And here's what I believe. In a posture of humility, and maybe this is this is true or untrue. I'm not sure. I want to find out because I've wrestled with this. I believe humility puts you in a posture to serve. Do you agree? I don't know if you agree, but I, I think humility puts you in a posture of service. Pride puts you in a position to be served. Pride puts you in a place where you expect things to come to you, right? 
And humility puts you in a position to be ever watching for opportunities to do what? To serve and to care and to take up our cross and think less of ourselves and more of Jesus Christ and his mission is really difficult for us just as human beings. But Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 to 11 have this thing called the Christological hymn. I love this little section of scripture. It's Paul's epistle. It's his letter to the church in Philippi. And in this letter, there is this little section of scripture that when I start uh, reading it, you will know it and uh, you will have probably heard it. If you haven't, this is one of the most beautiful descriptions of the heart of humility you'll ever hear. It says this, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped or to use to his advantage. Rather, he took on the form of nothing. He made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant onto himself, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has exalted him to the highest place. He has given him the name that is above every name in heaven and on earth, And at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Where does that glory begin? In humility. In humility. And if we are called to be like Christ, I think this is Paul's very elegant way of saying what Jesus said. If you want to follow me, You must take up your cross. You must in some way die. You must let yourself be put into a position of service, not of receiving, not of exaltation, but a a, a role of of service. Are you willing to suffer the unseen humiliations of being a servant when you feel qualified to be served? Are we willing to suffer the death of our pride in order that the very spirit of Christ lives inside of us, and is well pleased to magnify Christ out of us? I think that's an important question. But the second reality we have to ask is, what does it mean to count the cost? Because Jesus calls us to the cross, but then he says, don't go there quickly. Don't just say yes in all your emotional fervor. Don't declare your love and devotion. Count the cost, which I think is really interesting. I think it's really interesting how he does this because we're so quick. I mean, that's how you buy a timeshare, right? You know, you're quick to see the advantages and you're, you, they get you before you count the cost. And you're like, oh, boo. Right now, I'm not saying timeshares are bad. I'm just saying their sales tactics prove that um, expedient motion in the purchase is critical to their business. Not counting the cost, but seeing only the advantages. Jesus tells us, count the cost. And earlier in this chapter, we we read about a banquet invitation. An invitation to the banquet. This was in day 17's devotion. And the reality of this is all the people invited gave excuses. They gave excuses. They were invited to this banquet. And the excuses were this. I just bought a field. I have to check on it. Did anybody ever grow up in a family where maybe like your dad was like, hey, um, I need to take a drive and look at this field? Anybody? It's like weird. My granddad would be like, hey, you want to go look at the mountains? Oh, no, that was cute for like a four-hour car ride in the mountains. And it was never as exciting as he thought. But, you know, I bought a field. I have to go check on it. Like, what's the field going to do? Run away? What a terrible excuse. Um, Okay, I just bought oxen. I must try them out. Well, I know, it, it's a farming thing, I guess. Um, I just got married. I can't, I can't come. I can't be there. I, I'm a newlywed. I think we could re-spin it into some of our own language. I can't serve. I can't really do anything in church because I just got a boat and I really only have one day off. And summer's are short in Michigan, so I just, I'm sorry, I can't be a part of that right now. I have other things, right? That would be a cultural equivalency. Or, um, I'm sorry, I, I can't come. I, I needed more hours, and I picked up a shift, you know, I got bills to pay. I got bills to pay. And um, we can look at it and we can say, you know, these are our excuses. But in the end, they didn't hold water because the invitation to the banquet was from Christ. 
But the cares, worries, and concerns of this life kept the invitees, the people who were invited, from coming and meeting with Christ. Remember last week I said, how strange would it be to stand at the altar, you know, and you get the dearly beloveds and uh, the I do's and the I will's, and then, you know, your husband and wife, and wow, we kiss, and then you're like, oh, awesome, and it's like Mr. and Mrs., and you send them down the aisle, and people, hey, you know, it's so nice, and then after that they don't speak for a number of years, you'd be like, that is a weird marriage. How weird would it be not to speak to your wife after your wedding day? Yet so many receive Christ and don't accept the invitation to a relationship with him. And I think it's fascinating that marriage and, and the church is the analogy. Jesus says, I am the groom and the church is the bride. And in marriage, there is a loss of identity and a conjoining of two different individuals becoming one. There are parts of you that have to go away because it doesn't work in relationship. Right There are certain things of you that have to go away, and so in the Christian life it's the same. So many receive Christ, but very few pursue a relationship with Jesus, and it's the pursuit of the relationship that, that matters. But Jesus says, count the cost and understand that I come first. Count the cost and understand that I come first. And it, it puts in my mind this idea of when I was young, and we played this game called King of the Mountain, and it's where you'd have either a snow pile or a hill or something, and usually this bruiser of a kid was on top of it, and it was our job to throw him off, right? Anybody else play King of the Hill? Yeah. And I think it's outlawed at schools. Um, so what one of, I think Ethan told me the other day, it's like, you know, um, battle on the bump, or uh, some other name, because, you know, like dodgeball has become a void ball, which I'm a, yeah. But anyways, um, King of the Mountain, right? It's this game where, uh, where one is prime, and everybody's trying to take it down. I think that is a good image for our walk with Christ. We put Christ first, and everything from every direction assails the mountain of our life, trying to pull Christ down and put themselves as King of the Mountain to get our prime attention, the role of being first is not one that's easily uh, handed over. There's always things fighting for our ten attention. I like to refer to it as the tyranny of the urgent. There's always things that want to pull us away. If I sit down to have a time of prayer, I guarantee my phone's about to blow up. I'm going to get lit up by people, hey, I need it, you know? And, and I wanted to have a moment with Christ just being quiet in prayer. So I literally have to put everything away so I can have time with him. Because the world wants to play king of the mountain with our lives. And it wants to take that time we have with Christ. So let me invite you to think of it this way, about staying salty, right? It's terrible to use a Dos Equis commercial for this, but I think it fits. You know the stay thirsty, my friends. The Dos Equis thing, I would say this, stay salty, my friends, right? Stay salty. How do we stay salty? How do, when we look at this, especially for those who are professing their faith this weekend, how do we look and challenge to stay salty? Don't be an imitation of it. Stay salty. How do we stay salty? And there's not a bunch of religious rules that will help you stay salty. There is a relationship with Jesus Christ. So I want to walk through th three things real quick that I believe will help you stay salty. Because remember what Jesus said, salt, when it loses its saltiness, is not good to be thrown on the field, and nor is it good to throw in a manure pile. That is saying something that it is as worthless as humanly possible. It's only good to be walked on. It's, it's nothing. So when we say, are you, how do you stay salty, we recognize that there has to be means to do that. And I believe those means are relational. The first one, we have a weekly rhythm here. Devotions, be in the word of God. Worship, be in the community of God that is centered on the word of God and the worship of God with the broader community of believers. And then groups, get into groups where the word of God is discussed, it's chewed on, it's processed, it's debated. We think about it like philosophers at times. We think about it as very practical moms and dads and kids and um, like adults, friends, whatever the, the context is, we chew through the scriptures in community, spirit-filled community. I think these three things matter. But here's the thing. When we talk about devotions, you can't know someone by proxy. 
you can't know someone. You probably heard me say the name Lincoln before. It's my big brother. He and I are very close, though we've been apart for years. We have a lot of crazy stories from our childhood. And um, it, yeah, it actually just makes me smile thinking about it. Um, he, he is very dear to me. We'll call each other and he'll say my name. There's a certain way only Link can say it. And I'm like, what? What? And I cannot wait to hear because he says he calls me brother. And when he does it with this certain like weird way, I know. I'm like, oh, like I, I just start giggling. And the kids always say, are you talking to Uncle Lincoln? Right? Um, there's this reality that I have a relationship with him. But the fact of the matter is that you can't know him by proxy. If you went up to my brother Lincoln, you're like, Lincoln, oh my goodness, you're the guy who built the bomb and blew himself up. That's awesome. And, so, and you started hanging out with him. He'd be like, you're a creep. Go away. I don't know you, but if I introduced you and you spent time with him and you introduced yourself to him, I guarantee you this, the guy would feed you well. He would drive you all over and show you stuff and tell stories. He would be a hoot for you to be around and you could get to know him for yourself, but you couldn't know him via me. Devotions is the capacity to know Jesus Christ, being in his word, inviting his spirit to fill you and being in a relationship with Jesus Christ on your own. Not via me, not via the church, but, but on your own. Feeding yourself, if you will. The next thing is, um, is groups. And I think groups really does one thing. It puts us in vulnerable community and it doesn't allow us to isolate, but it also keeps us from being Sunday-only Christians who have faith one day a week. Groups requires us to be accountable, to being known, to being who we said we are, and to being kind of out in the open with one another and being willing to be wrong publicly when we talk about Scripture because sometimes we're wrong. Sometimes we have a wrong interpretation and people disagree. It doesn't mean we're unlovable. It actually means we're in deep relationship. I believe groups keeps us from being Sunday-only Christians and it roots us into a deeper community and conversation about the Word of God. And then... There's worship. Worship, gathering with the full body and celebrating what God has done, whether you're at Rooster, whether you're at West, at Monday, Tuesdays at the table, or right here at Foundry, Maine. It doesn't matter where you are. Gathering with the body of Christ, standing up and being faithful to celebrate God's goodness and dig into God's word. It's like gathering in a great banquet hall and eating together. We share something significant around that table, around the Word of God. And I'm excited to say that for us as a church, when we gather weekly, people come out and they feel like, oh, I feel so focused and alive. And that's awesome and that's what it's supposed to do. But your devotions and your groups also allow you to stay salty through the week, right? Stay salty, my friends. And it's an everyday thing. It's being in the word of God, being in a relationship with God and knowing just because you salted your steak yesterday doesn't mean it worked on the chicken today, right? That's what we know is just because you had good devotions yesterday means you should propel into a good time with God today. It's a continual relationship from devotions to groups to worship. We stand together, we sit quietly, and we gather together in smaller groups, to do the one thing, stay salty. Stay a living witness to Jesus Christ. And for those who profess their faith long ago, I know a lot of us in this room are Christians, and I will say this to you as the overchurched people in the room. Transformation is a value we have at this church. And if you're coming here and slowly getting into a rut of staying the same, you're in the wrong church, period. We will not accept that you staying the same is okay. Stay salty. And salty is a dynamic process. It's constantly growing and constantly finding a way, well, to be like Philippians, the heart of Philippians 2, 5 through 11, right? In our relationships with one another, we remember that we should have the same mindset as Christ and reduce ourselves to the service of all for the glory of Jesus. Mature Christians have this idea sometimes that because you've been in church 30 years, You've got 30 years seniority. And at Foundry Church, we don't have a top-down leadership structure. We have a bottom-up. If you've got 30 years seniority, you're somewhere down here. And you should be serving everybody. You should be salty. Your life and witness should be vibrant to all. Not because you've been here, but because you've been in the Word of God. You've been in your groups. You've been in, in worship. And you're a servant to the people of God and His world so that people see Jesus and know Him. When we talk about a Christian's witness, it is as distinct as the salt we use to season our food. 
It is as distinct as that. Because without it, we all go, what's missing? And that's what happens in religion without the salty, vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ. It all looks good, but it just doesn't taste right. So for us as Christians, know this. We are called to pursue that deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. I invite you, once again, because I've always wanted to end this sermon with that commercial. Stay salty, my friends. Pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for this, uh, for this community, that we can be challenged to know you, to love you, and to root deeply into your word. Would you guard our hearts and minds as we gather around your word? Would you guard us to do the hard work of being in relationship? Relationship where we're fully known and really coming to know you more fully. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for who you are, the way you teach us through your scriptures, the way you enliven us and and help us see the scriptures differently by your Holy Spirit, the way you speak through your spirit-filled church, speaking words of life into us. Thank you that you have made a way that we could be in relationship with you. May we never take it for granted, and may our relationship with you shine brightly into this world. May we be living evidence of the goodness of God. And we thank you, Lord, that we get to celebrate new lives coming to Christ and we get to celebrate the people like of us who've been here a long time who are challenged to the same thing that these new believers are, to be salty, to be distinct, to add the flavor of heaven to the life we live. May that be true of us. God, we give you this time and we give you thanks for who you are and your sacrifice, your life, your death, and your resurrection that has redeemed us by your broken body and shed blood. In Christ's name, amen. Thanks for listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net.